God is good, amen? God, I guess, said, God has been blessing each and every night. Everything that uh, we have been enjoying, it's all about God. And God has been the one who's been sustaining us. And God is the one who's giving us the message night after night after night. And for those of you who were here last night, uh, who's the king that we were talking about last night again? King Jehoshaphat. Oh, praise the Lord. King Jehoshaphat. Somebody was listening last night. Okay. <laughs> king Jehoshaphat. Okay, and uh, when I look at the life of King Jehoshaphat, I look back on my life and, and I'm seeing so much similarity. It's not that I'm, I'm royal blood. I guess I am. I'm a child of the king. <laughs> but the things that I have made decisions of before was not based on the word of God. It's based on my opinion based on what I think was right. And I'm thinking, oh, praise God for the Bible. And, and I said to myself, I should have read the Bible earlier in my life. Yeah. Mm. But the Bible makes me fall asleep every time I read it. Doesn't it? Yeah. And then I just realized later on that it makes me fall asleep because there's a lot of things that I focus on except Him. But when I focus my thoughts on Him, it's like that song that we were singing, like night after night, turn your eyes upon Jesus, look into his beautiful face, and the things of this world will grow strangely dim. Amen? Amen. The more you focus on him, the more this world becomes dim. So, and there is this one beautiful, powerful quote, actually, that I read. I was reading through my, through my list of, of quotes this morning. By the way, the Lord woke me up at four in the morning. And at first, when, when I wake up, like in the wee hours of the night, most of the time, especially when I'm tired, I would, I would just be grumpy. But then I realized when the Lord wakes me up really early in the morning, and when you know for a fact that it's not your bladder that woke you up, <laughs> you know for a fact that there is just this strong conviction that you have to wake up. And I begin to realize it's God who's trying to wake me up. And just imagine this. God is trying to wake you up, to spend time with you. What a privilege it is, isn't it? It's like when a governor of, of, what, of Portland calls you and tells you, can I have breakfast with you? And, and he called you at 6. Would you say, no, 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 have it tomorrow? <laughs> no, you would not. You would move heaven and earth to prepare your house just to set that breakfast table. But come to think of it, if the God of the universe wakes you up at four, would you grumble? No. And when the Lord woke me up at four, usually after my devotions, I go back to sleep. My dear friends, this morning I just went on and on and on and on, and the Lord had me stay on my knees. And usually I don't have the rest of the topic for the whole week of prayer. And when Brother Jed asked me for, for, for the topic, I just gave him titles. But actually, I said, okay, that will change. <laughs> and he asked me for titles. That I usually come to the Lord and ask him, what message do you want me to share this, this day? And the Lord did not just make it clear what he's going to share for today because I, I already knew what's going to happen today because it's, I told you, it's the part two of what I shared yesterday but the lord changed wednesday and saturday and said okay lord and the lord just made it all clear isn't our god amazing yeah. that when we seek him he makes it for us so that that hour well i was well i was uh, going through my notes and i encountered this beautiful quote from signs of the times who among you here has been reading from the articles of signs of the times only a few you know what? I, the more I looked at uh, powerful verses, powerful quotes from, from the spirit of prophecy that was mentioned by, by most authors, I've seen signs of the times come up so often. And then one day, I was somehow uh, intrigued. So I started with the first article. Actually, the first article was not written there. It jumped off right away to the faith of Abraham, my dear friends. Was I hooked? <laughs> was I hooked? 
And right now, for the past two years, my devotional was Signs of the Times. <laughs> Sometimes when I read the devotionals that are just one page, it's just like, no, there's, there's still more that I want to have. But Signs of the Times is like, like five pages, sometimes 10 pages. So you had like a full breakfast. It's like having breakfast with rice. Amen? Amen. <laughs> so this, <laughs> this, this quote from Signs of the Times, September 7, 1888, paragraph 12. Listen to this. Men cannot depart from the counsel of God. Men cannot depart from the counsel of God and retain their peace and restfulness of soul. Did you get this? When man departs from the counsel of God, peace and restfulness could not stay in the soul. And listen, there is no insanity so dreadful, so hopeless as that of following human wisdom, unguided by the wisdom of God. Wow. Such a powerful thought. With that being said, let us kneel down for a word of prayer. Our dear God, our loving Heavenly Father, our ever-patient God, Lord, thank you so much for being so good to us. Your goodness, dear Father, we don't deserve. Your blessings even more, dear Father, we don't deserve. So, dear Father, we bow before you right now, acknowledging that we have been quite stubborn with our decisions with the things that we have been doing in our lives and tonight dear father we just like to ask you to please teach us lord teach us dear father how to submit everything to you how to let you decide from us how to decide on things based on your wisdom and not on the things that we usually do and dear father i pray that tonight dear, dear lord that you please pour your spirit upon us Convict us, Lord, of the things that we have been doing in the past that we need to change today. And may everything that we do or say or even think will all be done for the glory of your name. Lord, I ask that you please hide me behind the shadow of your cross, that I may not be seen or be heard. Even the desire to be seen or to be heard, Lord, please take that away, that you and you alone will be seen, be lifted up, be magnified and exalted. Your Father, tonight we ask that you please pour upon us a full measure of your Spirit. May you speak to each and every heart. And may our hearts, our minds be centered upon you. We ask this in the loving name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Amen. What is the theme of our week of prayer again? Okay, thank you, Auntie Leslie. Absolute reliance, Rebecca. Absolute reliance. It sounds so good, isn't it? It sounds so good. It sounds so desirable, but it's quite difficult. Like if Jehoshaphat only absolutely relied on God, things would have changed. He would not have gone to war. He would not, he would not have committed that mistake if only he relied on God. But his biggest hindrance, his biggest hindrance during the time was what? His biggest hindrance was his blessing. He was blessed beyond measure. So, one thing that I've seen right now, that I could conclude, our biggest hindrance is our strength. Would you agree with that? Amen. The biggest hindrance is our strength. It's quite confusing, isn't it? Yeah. Our biggest hindrance is our strength? What? My biggest hindrance is my talent? <laughs> My biggest hindrance is my intellect. My biggest hindrance is my accomplishments. Actually, it is. Anything that will stop us or will hinder us from relying fully on God will be our hindrance. And what is that thing that stops us from relying on God? Our so-called strength. We rely so much on our strength, like Jehoshaphat relied on his strength, that he did not rely on God. Amen? Amen? And I'd like to read this to you. I, I got this from this book. Who among you has read this book? 
It's very, one very interesting book. It's like an excerpt. It's like a righteousness by faith book. Very, very much condensed. There are some pages here. There are some, the chapters here, some of it are just like this long of a paragraph. That's one chapter. But you could not get through that chapter without being hit. Being like, oh, I, I should dwell on this for the rest of, of the day. Listen to this, to this uh, chapter. This is chapter 46 or 45. It says here, oh, by the way, can you think about like the dominant strength in your life? I know all of us, we identify our strengths and our weaknesses, don't we? And we know we don't have to be, to be modest right now. I, I don't want you to speak up your strength. But think about it. We are living in a digital world right now, very technologically advanced. So I want you to imagine you have a very high-tech typewriter right now that only you can see. So type your strength. <laughs> Start typing. You're typing? OK. OK. Now, put that in bold letters. Are you putting it in bold letters? Underline it. Highlight it. Put a box before it and put a check. Because in a few moments, that will be destroyed. <laughs> Listen, when you are strong, then you are weak. It's quite confusing again. And you are weak in the very point where your strength is. Wow. You are weak in the very point where your strength is. Why? Because you are very apt to pride yourself in your strong points. We always like people to see our strong points. When we meet people, we have subtle ways of telling them how good you are in this field, in that field. Huh? We want somehow people to see that you are strong in this and that. And I like this this uh, this point whatever point it is that you trust in that point is especially weak and lastly I like the last line you have nothing but weak points what can you say church you have nothing but weak points you have nothing but weak points when you hear those words when you have nothing but weak points only a few people said amen <laughs> you have nothing but weak points <laughs> Uh, they're Amen. not taking me seriously. Amen. You have nothing but weak points. Amen. 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 So when people tell you, you are weak, you tell them, thank you for reminding me. <laughs> Why? Because God has said, oh, this is a beautiful verse. My grace is sufficient for thee. For my strength is made perfect. In what? In your weakness. In your weakness. Isn't that beautiful? So when we think that we are strong, we are actually weak because the strength that we have is only ours. But when you consider yourself as weak, that weakness will somehow drive you to cling on His strength. And now it's not your strength, your human strength, but it's supernatural strength yes. that will be displayed in your life. Yes. Amen? Amen? I don't know about anyone here who has read the book, The Project Pearl. Have you read that book? Oh, it is not a Seventh-day Adventist book. It's one of the books that one of my evangelist friends somehow encouraged me to read. That book was actually one of our devotionals when we went for a mission trip in Burma. And this book is about uh, that uh, China is not open to the gospel yet. Until now, it's not, it's not open, but it's not as strict as then. And having a Bible in China is just so difficult. When, when, you have, when you want to read a Bible in China, you have to travel for months. You have to travel for like at least three months to get to see a Bible. And you are not somehow, you are not somehow assured that you could hold it or read it. You could see one, but you could not hold it or read it. So this group of people Headed by, headed by this guy, his name is uh, Brother David. They, they changed his name. Brother David, they, they kept his name. He has the burden to bring Bibles to China. Make long story short, 
they brought one million Bibles to China. Wow. One million Bibles to China, and you have to, re to read this book. I guess if a church reads this book, you will be encouraged because this is not just one miracle that happened to one person. This is like a miracle that happens in a whole group that did their work in the path that God had had them, had them work on. So fast forward now, the Bible has arrived in China. And now the thing is they have to distribute these Bibles to the people in the village, in the village of Guangdong. I don't know if anyone here has reached that village. I have not gone to, to China. But this village, there is this one pastor. His, his name is Pastor John. And Pastor John is 70 plus years old. And you know, in, in China, churches are illegal. They're called house churches. And Pastor John actually consigned 10,000 Bibles. And he knew for a fact that, that the authorities will come and he will be one of the target because he had been to prison back and forth, back and forth because of his faith. And, they, and he said, if they attack my house, they will dig up everything. They will turn this house upside down and they will see the Bibles. So you know what he did? He went to his friend's barn, dig a huge hole and dump the 10,000 pieces of Bible there. For sure, people from Beijing came, searched his house, and they could not see anything, and yet they brought him to be interrogated in the police station. And he saw that people who, are, people who came in to interview him wore suits, and these are people coming from Beijing. Now he realized this is serious business. They threatened him, they gave him a lot of, of, of offer. We will, we will lessen your, your sentence, just reveal to us the names of those people who are involved. Pastor John kept silent. And because of his silence, he was somehow brought out. It irritated the people who are interviewing him. They, they saw it as an arrogance. So they brought him outside and they let him stand. By the way, how old is Pastor John again? 70. 70 plus. plus. He's more than 70 years old. And they let him stand on a box, on a wooden box that's four feet. I'm, it's, it's like my height. <laughs> yeah, I'm a little taller than four feet. It's a four feet box and less than a foot wide. He, take note, this is not a wide box. Less than a foot wide, so you're like barely standing. If, if it's wider, it's good, you could, you could take your balance. And this, this pastor, they put a, a rope behind his back, they tied his hand and they put a noose around his head and tied it to the rafters. And he was placed in the middle of this like square in, inside a prison where all the prisoners will witness how they will treat him. And they say, okay, if you will not give us the names, then you will die for, for what you are you're standing for. And then you know what he said? I am willing to die for my Lord Jesus Christ. He said, so if you will just confess about the name we will take this burden off of you and you are free to go we will lessen your sentence just confess and then you know what he confessed he confessed about his savior he confessed about jesus christ and they told him okay so you would not give in right now then you will die here and the guards were waiting for this old man to somehow just fall apart he stood his ground and he began talking about Jesus. He gave a Bible study. <laughs> and, and then the guard told him, yeah, you're not afraid to die because look at you. You're about to die anyway. So this is like a suicide for you. Okay, okay do it. And then so he spoke. He was there early in the morning and he spoke for the whole day. And, and when the sun was about to set, his legs were about to give out. And he said, Lord, please, Give me power from on high that I may be able to stand here to tell more about you. Amen. Make long story short, there was just like, he said, there was like an electricity coming from on high that it hit him and all of a sudden his legs were strengthened. No food, no drink, no rest, no sleep. He spoke throughout the day. The morning came. He was still standing. 
and he was preaching. And during that day, he said, his throat was dried up, but said, nothing could stop me, Lord, from giving this word. Please send me relief. And the Lord gave him rain. <laughs> he was able to drink from the rain. In the middle of the rain, he was still preaching. <laughs> knees were shaking, but now, knees were shaking before, but now he was strengthened. And these people were, were waiting for him to fall, but he never fell. End of the second day came. He was still standing. The next day, he was still standing. Now people are beginning to pay more attention to what he's speaking of. Because they're saying, look at this old guy. He's supposed to fall a few days ago, but he's still standing. Just imagine no food, no drink, no rest, no sleep, and he's still standing. Five days passed by, and he was still standing. A week passed by, he was still standing. Now people from all around are, are getting so curious about this guy, about what he's speaking about. What he's, he's speaking about might, might be really powerful, might be really true, because until now he's still standing. And now even officials, government officials from other sectors came to visit this prison just to see this guy who's standing for more than a week more than a week, my dear friends, and still standing strong. And then the 11th day came. Yes, 11th day. 11th day came, and his foot was swollen. His legs were swollen like twice the size. Just imagine twice the size of his regular foot, and he's standing on a platform that's less than a foot wide. And he said, Lord, I can't bear the pain anymore, but anything that I can do for your kingdom, just, just strengthen me. And the Lord strengthened him. He reached the 12th day, and he was still standing up. On the 13th day, a storm came. And it, it shaked not just the faith of, of Pastor John, but even his whole body. But he was hanging on to the Lord. I said, Lord, I'm hanging on to you. Even at the last breath that you have given me, I will hang on to you. And the wind blew so hard, and the guards were there waiting, waiting. The guards are so patient, are they? <laughs> They're waiting for him to die. They are waiting for him to just give up. But this guy never gave up. The wind blew him so hard, the rain beat on his body until such time that he could not hold it any longer. And he fell, and everything just blocked out. But a few minutes, he was awake. And he could not understand. He thought that he was dead already. A few minutes, he was awake. And this person who came to him, he could not recognize because everything was like a blur. And this person was giving him water. said, uncle, uncle, please wake up. Please wake up. And then we finally realized that this guy who's calling him uncle is one of the guards. So please wake up. Don't die, uncle. Don't die. And then he was now confused. Why are these people asking him not to die? These are the people who are expecting, waiting for him to die. And when he woke up, when he finally sat down, and he said his whole body ached so hard because he has not been in any other position for the whole 13 days except standing up, no rest, no food, no water. And now they, they're feeding him water. He said, do not die yet. Please tell us. And then Pastor John told him, why, what happened? Tell me what happened. He said, a storm happened, and then you fell, and then you were hanging in this rope. And all of a sudden, there was a lightning. And it struck just a few inches about your rope, and you fell to the floor. And please tell us about the Jesus that you're talking about. <laughs> My dear friends, Dr. John gave his testimony, gave a doctrine about Jesus, and scores of people from the prison gave their lives to the Lord. Amen. Amen. Glory to God. Pastor John did not win these people because of his strength. 
The strength that God gave was made so obvious because of John's weakness. Amen? Amen. And I like something that, that I wrote a while ago. I wrote here, If we stubbornly refuse to rely on Him, we lose the chance to see the victory that God can do through us. Can you say amen? Amen. A lot of times that the Lord has been somehow asking us, just, just trust me in all of your ways. Just trust me in everything. But we somehow refuse to. Why? Because we want to trust or we want to rely on our own strength. We want to rely on our own experience. And sometimes we want to rely on the strength of other people. We want to rely on our own resources. If only Jehoshaphat knew about this. But you know what? It was not too late. Jehoshaphat knew that he could lean on God. And when he came back from that war, Prophet Jehu told him, he rebuked Jehoshaphat, you have done wrong in the eyes of God. You have to repent. And Jehoshaphat repented. And you know what? God blessed Jehoshaphat even more. Amen? Amen. But when we go to 2 Chronicles chapter 20, then that's where, that's where the beauty or that's where the excitement begins. 2 Chronicles chapter 20 began with the news that there are three nations about to fight Jehoshaphat. That's the nation of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir. And just imagine, without any warning, they just saw, somebody just saw this, this group of nations coming forward. And in 2 Chronicles 20 verse 3, it says here, And Jehoshaphat feared. Jehoshaphat what? Is fear, is fear a, a blessing or a curse? Huh? Sometimes it's a blessing, is it? Because remember in chapter 17, he didn't fear. He was so, he was so proud of his, of his strength. He was so proud of the accomplishments that God has given him. He forget to acknowledge that everything came from God, that he relied on his strength and he relied on Ahab. And he did not rely on God. But this time it says here, Jehoshaphat feared and set himself to seek the Lord and proclaimed a fast all throughout Judah. What did Jehoshaphat do? Jehoshaphat called for the church board. Let's go, let's meet. Let's have, let's meet for the whole day. No. Did not have time to have church board meeting. He did not have time to plot out any battle plan. And Jehoshaphat did the right thing. Jehoshaphat declared a fast. Can you say amen to that? Amen. When we are faced with certain situations, we always want to crack each other's minds. We want to, brew, to do some brainstorming. That's what we get, storms. Mm -hmm. Am I right? Yes. Instead of coming to the Lord, Lord, we don't know, but you do. And that's what Jehoshaphat did. He declared a fast. Instead of calling for a church board meeting, instead of giving your brilliant ideas, let us seek the Lord's ideas. Yes. Amen? Amen. And, and it says here, Jehoshaphat from Prophets and Kings, chapter 15, entitled Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat was a man of courage and valor. For years he had been strengthening his armies and fortified cities. He was well prepared to meet almost any foe. Yet in this crisis he put not his trust in the arms of flesh, not by disciplined armies and fenced cities, but by a living faith in the God of Israel. Could he hope to gain the victory over this heathen who boasted of their power to humble Judah in the eyes of the nations? Isn't this beautiful? This is the time that he could fight any battle of his life, but he, he did not rely on the armies that he set, on the 45 cities that surround him and said, this is the time to rely on God. Jehoshaphat learned his lesson. Amen? And a beautiful quote as well from Prophets and Kings, uh, from Patriarchs and Prophets, page 493, paragraph 2. Listen to this. God will do great things for those who trust in Him. Can you say amen? Amen. amen. Your amen is too weak. Amen. <laughs> amen. amen. The reason why... His professed people have no greater strength is that they trust so much in their own wisdom. Oh, wow. 
The reason why his professed people have no greater strength is that they trust so much in their own wisdom and do not give the Lord an opportunity to reveal his power in their behalf. He will help his believing children in every emergency if they place their entire confidence in him and faithfully obey him. Can you say amen? amen? If they put their entire confidence in Him, not on your past glories, not on your past experiences, yes. have you not learned? We're still here. We are still here until now. It's because we have been relying so much on the methods that have happened in the past, on our strength not on the strength that he can give, but on the strength that we can get from other people, that not from him. And we are here every hundred years. We celebrate hundred years of anniversary. How come we are celebrating that we're still here <laughs> after a hundred years? It should be a hundred years of mourning. Can you say amen? amen. It should not be a hundred years of celebration. It should be a hundred years of contemplation. Why, Lord, are we still here? And you now know the answer. You have relied so much on your wisdom. We have relied so much on our own strength yeah. and not on Him. Let us move on. And remember, remember Jehoshaphat, before they went to war with, with Ahab, Ahab convinced him to go, but he wanted to make sure. So he asked the prophet of God, he asked the prophet of God for advice and the, Lord, and the Lord said to the prophet that you will lose. And still he went on. Jehoshaphat is like us, like kids. Sometimes we ask our parents, so mom, dad, can I do this? He said, no, you will fail. And then I do it anyway. <laughs> we are so like Jehoshaphat, aren't we? That was Jehoshaphat in chapter 17, but chapter 20 is a different Jehoshaphat. I like his prayer. He's like a kid running to his father and talking to his father about the bully that's trying to destroy his life. Listen, verse 12. O our God, wilt thou not judge them? We have no might against this great company that cometh against us. Neither know we what to do, but our eyes are upon you. My friends, this is the best prayer Jehoshaphat ever prayed. For me, this is one of the best prayers that the king ever prayed in the Bible. And this is the prayer I want to pray every day of my life. Lord, I don't know what to do, but my eyes are upon you. Amen? Amen. Let me ask you about another, another king. His name is King Solomon. Remember King Solomon? Wise man. The wise man. In his reign, can you guess which part of his reign was the peak of his glory? Which part? He has a lot of accomplishments, huh? He has a lot of strength that we could, that we could look around and, and pinpoint. But where do you think it is? Don't worry. When, when you're wrong, I will, not, I will not disfellowship you. I don't have the right to disfellowship you. Okay, any guess? Which part? What was the question again? Which part of Solomon's reign was the peak of his glory? Like, that was just his, the height of his career. Oh, okay, so that was like the, the yeah. talents that he received. Okay, but sorry, Becca, it's wrong. <laughs> okay. I think it was when uh, he asked the Lord for wisdom. For wisdom. Yeah. That was what I, I was thinking, but it's wrong, brother. <laughs> and last one, last one. Some of you will say it's when he built the temple. Ah, because even the temple is not called God's temple. It was called... Solomon's temple. Yeah. Uncle Mario. When uh, he humbled himself, that he cannot, uh, he asked God wisdom to, uh, to reign over his people. Okay, when he humbled, you are there. Listen to this. And this really blew my mind. This was like a light bulb moment for me when I read this. Testimonies, volume 9, page 281, paragraph 2, it says here. Solomon was never so rich, so wise, or so truly great 
as when he confessed to the Lord, I am but a child. I don't know how to go out or to come in. Isn't that beautiful? The peak of his glory was not the time that he had wisdom to rule over Israel. It's not the time when he built, and it's not the time when he judged people. It's not the time when he cut this and that. It was the time when he came to the Lord and he confessed, I am but a child. I don't know how to go out or to come in. Then I dwelt on this thought, Lord, explain to me why. Why is that? And then it hit me. That was the time of Solomon's reign. That was one of the only times in Solomon's reign that God could lead Solomon. That was one of the few times that Solomon absolutely relied on God. Amen? Amen. Amen. You're not convinced, huh? Yes. <laughs> Amen? Amen? That was the only time, I guess, that God could say to Solomon, Solomon, go to this place. And Solomon would not wait any, any longer and he would go. Have you noticed when you have kids and when they're small, when you lead them and you don't know how to walk, the moment you let go, what do they do? They cry and fall. They need you. But the moment they know how to walk, where do they go? <laughs> Away from you. <laughs> and have you noticed the place where they want to go? The road. <laughs> they always want to go to the most dangerous places and the parents are, are having a heart attack. And this is what we're doing to God. Mm -hmm. We're giving God a heart attack in our choices. <laughs> yes. We always make the crazy choices that will put us in danger apart from God's wisdom. We're terrible, amen. Amen. So, let us move on. Oh, even Christ himself said, I cannot my own self do what? Do anything, do nothing. So if Christ could admit that, would it be easy for us to admit it as well? Yeah, Apart from you, Lord, I could do nothing. And verse 13, take note of this. By the way, when, when the Bible mentions about numbers, about groups of people, what is the group of, of people that, that the Bible is mentioning? Only what? Men, isn't it? Yes. He doesn't count children. He doesn't count the wives. Only men. It says here, verse 13, and I noticed something strange here. All Judah stood before the Lord. Their little ones, their wives, and their children. And then it hit me. Wow. The Bible was very specific. The Bible wants us to know that everyone was there. No one was left at home. No one was left at home. If you came to Judah during this time, it would be a ghost town. No one was there. Everyone was inside the temple, fasting and praying. Even the little ones, my dear friends. Isn't it amazing? Judah came from all direction and fasted and prayed. Oh, and remember, the beautiful promise in 2 Chronicles 7, verse 14. We know this. If my people, which are called by my name, shall what? What's the first prerequisite again? It's not pray. It's humble themselves and I pray. And again, I pray to the Lord, Lord, why? Why humble? And then the Lord's answer was, because you're not. Simple answer. Why was that the first prerequisite? Because we're not. We are not humble. How can we be humble when we have full of strength? When we are full of talents? When we have been educated? When we have all these accolades? It's difficult to humble ourselves. Huh? Actually, it's easy. Only if you focus on the, on the ultimate example, who humbled himself first. Amen? If we humble ourselves and pray and seek His face and turn from our wicked ways, then the condition is given, will I hear from heaven? And the Lord met this condition because His people humbled themselves and prayed. And through the prophet, and, and through the prophet Jehaziel came the word of the Lord. And He said, Be not afraid nor dismayed for the reason of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours but God's. Yes. The moment I read this verse, it was just like I was jumping up and down. Yes. 
the Lord just said, the battle is not yours, but mine. One thing that I realize here, anything that we surrender to the Lord, anything that we give to the Lord, the Lord takes it as His. The Lord takes it as His. Amen? Amen. Amen. Do you have any battle in your life that you keep on losing again and again and again and again? The reason for that matter is we have not really given it to the Lord. We have not really humbled ourselves to the Lord and said, Lord, please take this. Because if we have, the Lord would have fought that battle already. Amen? Amen? Amen. And let us move on. Oh, it gets exciting. I tell you. Sorry for my excitement. No, no, I'm not asking for apology for my excitement. <laughs> Another thing here. He says, Ye shall not need to fight in this battle. Stand ye still and see the salvation of the Lord with you. It's like God is telling them, Just watch and wait. And I'll show you what I can do. Yes. Can you say amen? amen? God is somehow speaking to each and every one of us. If you surrender this to me, just watch and see what I'm going to do. And listen, fear not nor be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them for the Lord your God will be with you. Yes. Isn't that a beautiful, a beautiful promise? When God is with us, who can be against us, my dear friends? Amen? Amen. Oh, Testimonies, Volume 6, 306, Paragraph 3, one of my favorite quotes. All who consecrate body soul and spirit to God's service will be continually receiving a new endowment of physical, mental, and spiritual power. Isn't that beautiful? The inexhaustible supplies of heaven are at their command. What supplies? Inexhaustible. You cannot exhaust it. You'll be exhausted, but the supplies will not be. <laughs> Amen? Amen. Isn't that powerful? Christ gives them the breath of His own Spirit, the life of His own life, and the Spirit puts forth its highest energies to work in the heart and in the mind. The Holy Spirit puts forth its highest. It did not just say its energy. Its highest energy to work in the heart and in the mind. Let's move on. And this is one amazing thing about Jehoshaphat. Verse 18, it says there, And Jehoshaphat bowed his head with his face to the ground, and all Judah and inhabitants of, of Jerusalem fell before the Lord and worshipped God. What is something not so right in this? Not so, no, this is right, but what is unusual in this verse? And Jehoshaphat bowed his head to the ground, and all Judah, have you noticed something? The king bowed to the Lord first in front of his people bowed his head to the ground he did not just bow but bowed his head where to the ground in front of his people the king should be the highest person in the whole congregation isn't he yes. the king does not bow down before his people and this is one thing that Jehoshaphat set here in his people the example of humility Sometimes it's difficult for us leaders to bow down. Because, man, I have been an elder here for, for 17 years. I have a doctorate degree. I'm an engineer. I'm a doctor. I finished high school. <laughs> Why should I bow down? But Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, gave us an example. He bowed his head before the ground, before the Lord. Because he was not just bowing to the people. He was bowing to the Lord. Amen? Amen. Amen. And, the pa and the people followed. This is one lesson for leadership here. Yes. A lesson of humility. When we humble ourselves, the people will follow. Amen? Amen. Let us continue. Oh. Oh. We're running out of time. <laughs> I'll scrap the other story. Okay. And they rose early in the morning, 20. And Jehoshaphat told his people, Believe in the Lord your God, so ye shall be established. Believe in his prophets, so ye shall prosper. Have you noticed right now that it's not just the Bible that is attacked? It's also the gift of the spirit of prophecy. 
this is the reason why that the work of the Lord is not, is not going anywhere. Yeah. Because the prophet is being attacked. The word is being diminished. But this is the counsel of Jehoshaphat, the king, to his people. Believe in the Lord your God, and ye shall be established. Believe in his prophets, and ye shall prosper. Verse 21, And when he consulted with the people, he appointed singers unto the Lord. And this is crazy, isn't it? Yes. He put the choir in front for battle. I'm thinking, Lord, this is crazy, but this is beautiful, isn't it? He put the choir in front of the battle. He did not put the SWAT team. He did not put the presidential guard. He did not put the Navy, the Marines. He put the choir. I'm thinking, how can a choir fight in a battle? There's only one way. If the choir sings so terrible, the enemies would run away. <laughs> they will just say, please stop. But this, I know this is the choir. This is the official choir. And this is one amazing thing about our God. His ways are not our ways. Amen. His thoughts are not our thoughts. God's ways most of the time is foolishness in the eyes of the world. But His ways are the best ways. Amen? Amen. Okay. And, oh, and when they began to sing and to praise, the Lord set ambushments. Did you get this? Not until they begin to sing and to sing praises, the Lord did not do anything. They took the Lord's promise before it even happened. And they believed it and they celebrated. They have praised God before it even happened. And the Lord set ambushments. And you know what happened? The children of Ammon and Moab fought against Mount Seir. The Lord set a confusion. And then after they killed Mount Seir, it says here, they helped slay one another. They helped slay one another. And when Judah arrived, when Judah arrived on that hill, what they saw was a field of dead bodies. And another thing here in verse 24, if you have your Bibles with you, read the last two, read the last two words there. Auntie Leslie, are you there? Verse 24, what are the last two words, Auntie? Um, 24, had none had None escape. Something is so unusual here because every battle, there's always runners going back to the kingdom. Did you get this? Yeah. There's always runners going back. The king has been captured. The prince is dead. We need more armies. There's always runners going back. Even the runners here are dead. None escape. Three kingdoms combined together and none was left behind. Conclusion, if God is the one fighting your battle, nothing would escape God. Yes. Amen. Amen? Amen. If, God, if God is the one fighting your battles, my dear friends, all bases will be covered. Yeah. Isn't this beautiful? And now, we'll go to the most interesting part. And when Jehoshaphat and his people came to take away the spoil of them, they found among them in abundance both riches with the dead bodies and precious jewels, which they stripped off for themselves, more than they could carry. And they were three days and gathering of the spoil. It was so much. Friends, I'd like to ask you this question. How difficult it is to get jewelries or sword, shield, and armor from a dead person. Could a dead person say, do not take my watch. <laughs> it's a sentimental value. My mom gave it to me. They could not protest. Question, how many dead bodies can you clean in one day? I Rebecca? I haven't exactly had that okay. opportunity to, you know. Yeah. <laughs> so, like, estimate. Say, 100? Whoa. The pastor is, is a diligent worker. <laughs> can anyone clean 100? Okay, not, not all of us are, are so hardworking. 50. 50, okay, still so many, huh? Oh, let, let's, let's settle with 20. You have to agree at 20 or else you're very lazy already. <laughs> 20 is okay? 20. One. Oh, tw one. Oh, Brother Roger, you can do more than that. You could be one of the choirs. <laughs> 20, we agreed on 20. 
Yeah. Let me remind you of our story yesterday. How many soldiers Jehoshaphat had? One million a hundred and sixty thousand. Friends, let us be conservative here. Let's scrap the hundred and sixty thousand. Let's just stay with one million. Multiply that by twenty. Multiply that by three days. Now everyone is silent. <laughs> Did you get this? This is just a very conservative estimate. Sixty million. When they arrived, everyone dead. Did they even take their swords out of their holster? No. How many arrows did they shot? None. None. My dear friends, it's all God who did it. This is what happens when the Lord fights our battle. Amen. This is what happens when God's solution is the one that is being applied. This is what happens when God moves, when man just follows. This is what happens, my dear friends, when God's people humble themselves before Him and wait for His direction. Can you say amen? Amen. amen. Haven't we learned anything? Every single year, we try to go ahead of God. Every single year, we keep on repeating the same mistakes again and again and again and again. Mm -hmm. Why? Because we think we have the solution. My dear friends, we have to accept only God has the solution. And God's solution is way, way, way better than all our solutions combined. Actually, our solution kills His solution. We have to trust Him. We have to seek Him. We have to rely on Him. Absolutely reliance. This is the only way. This is the only sure way. God wants us to depend on Him so fully. Lastly, I'd like to read this to you. Oh, from Ministry of Healing, page 159. To everyone who offers himself to the Lord for service, withholding nothing, is given the power for the attainment of measureless results. Can you say amen? amen? Can you measure those dead bodies? No. We are just estimating here. The question is, can you still measure what this church can do? Yes. My conclusion is, it says here, to everyone who offers himself to the Lord for service, withholding nothing, is given the power for the attainment of measureless results. If you could still measure the results in your life, it means to say you're still holding back from God. If you're still holding back from God, you could still count the results. Isn't that beautiful? God is just waiting for us to give it all to Him. Not hold back from Him anymore. Not hold back our trust on Him. Not hold back our faith. Not hold back our reliance. Not hold back our surrender to Him. What do we have to lose? We are losing anyways. It's time to see the victory of God in our lives, in our churches, in our ministries, in our community.